reminded of the little boy who was listening to things and understanding it on his level of things. And he would hear the director of the songs announce the song to follow the sermon. As was announced earlier, the song of invitation. But in his ears, he couldn't figure that out. And he asked his mother one day, says, what kind of song is the song of limitations? You know, sometimes we do have to be careful about certain things. We have the, that terminology, no matter how biblical it may be, that a lot of people don't use. And a lot of churches don't even have an opportunity at the end of a sermon to, to respond because they don't even have a view of things that way. In fact, some of that's got over into the church where they've done away with, quote, a song of invitation. Um, we would do well at times to explain to folks what we mean by some of our terminology, no matter how close we speak as the oracles of God, because they just don't come from that kind of background. So I thought that was a pretty good way to realize <laughs> what is the song of limitations. <laughs> Not long ago, I started a series of sermons on Sunday afternoon on spirituality. I did that because so many times if you ask people their concept, of, or at least the meaning, to being spiritual, and that you get all sorts of funny ideas. But I wanted to show that really being spiritual is to live on the spiritual level. To live on the spiritual level, the level of the Spirit, is to live according to the teachings of the Bible. That's all spirituality is. It equates with being faithful. If you're faithful to the Lord, as the Bible defines faithfulness, you are a spiritual person. If you are a spiritual person, then it's because you are faithful to the Lord. We pointed out, and I'll rehearse this to bring our minds back up to gear on this, as to the importance of spirituality. First of all, we emphasized at that time that only the spiritually minded can discern the Word of God. Now, we emphasize at that point that it was by revelation through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets who wrote the Bible that we receive the mind of God. That is, through natural processes, through simply sitting down and reasoning with the mind God gave us, we're not going to understand the way of salvation. We're not going to understand how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life. So we have to be ready to receive with the meekness and grafted word which is able to save our souls. And that word was revealed from heaven. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then too we learn from Galatians 6, 1 that only the spiritual can restore the erring. That is, only those who are faithful to the Lord themselves can restore those who have erred from the faith. And that's why that we learned that the church of our Lord that we studied about this morning is the spiritual house. It's Christ's spiritual house kingdom. It's where the things are done on the spiritual level by the direction of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the Word of God. Two, we emphasize that acceptable service must be spiritual. Remember, the church is a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2.5. So we're interested in that. That's what it means again, another way of saying it, to be faithful to the Lord. We must walk by what the Spirit has revealed. And we must live as the Spirit directs us. So we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Again, it's saying the same thing, Ephesians 6, 17. To be spiritual is to abide by the Word of God. Then only the law of the Spirit can make men free, according to Paul in Romans 8 in verse 2. So we're interested then in following the law the Holy Spirit's revealed that we might live on a spiritual level. So again, it's another way of saying the gospel is the power of God to save us. And it would do well if we would emphasize at this point that in the right division of the word, we'll see that uh, the same topic may refer, be referred to in different ways. And when we understand the way it is referred to, the different ways it's referred to, then we have a better and deeper understanding of the matter itself. It would be like the 
institution of the saved be referred to as the church or the kingdom or the body of Christ or the family of God. We understand it better when we understand what all those terms mean as they refer to it. And we see too from the Bible and emphasize the last time together that the mind of the Holy Spirit is essential to life and peace. If I want to have the mind of Christ, I have to go to the will of Christ. And the only place I'm going to find the will of Christ is in the New Testament of Christ. So here again we see that it's the power of the gospel uh, by that power that we are made what we are. But that power is located in words. And those words tell us what to do. Then we may emphasize that only those who are led by the Spirit are truly the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8 and verse 14. So again, how does the Spirit of God lead us? Well, it's through the will of Christ, in the words of Christ, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Only by the Spirit can we put to death the deeds of the body or mortify the deeds of the body. Uh, this is what is involved when you see the works of the flesh listed by Paul in Galatians 5, telling us that if we do these things, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he turns around and tells us, but if we do the following things, we will inherit the kingdom of God. So again, when you speak of being spiritual, it is abiding by the will of God. And that helps us understand better why um, the whole duty of man is simply to keep the commandments of God. So if you can be spiritual without keeping the commandments of God, that'll be quite, <laughs> quite an interesting effort on your part. I can tell you it's doomed to failure before you begin. So only by the Spirit are we able to understand the mind of Christ as He's revealed the words of Christ or the will of Christ and the words of Christ. And we must sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. In other words, I must live on the plane of the spiritual. Why do I know how to do that except by the word revealed by the Spirit which is addressed to my inward man or spirit? Galatians 6, 7, 8. And there are no exceptions to this. Christians must also bear the fruit of the Spirit. Well, how do I do that? Well, when I carry out in my life what the Bible says I am to do, then there will be produced what ought to be produced. It just works that way. It's in the divine scheme of things. It works according to the way God made us to be able to live on the level of the Spirit. That is, of our spiritual being. When we follow the Word of God, we're living then not according to the flesh, but according to the inward man or the Spirit. That's why that Christ said, and we referred to it this morning, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing, John 15, 5. Well, again, what does it mean? It means keeping the commandments of God. And then the last point we emphasized at that time was that we cannot have true happiness without spirituality. But again, spirituality is not some sort of uh, floating about a foot off the ground and looking pious. It is doing what God said do. When uh, Jesus was cleansing the temple, that was a spiritual thing. When Jesus was saying what he did in the Sermon on the Mount, consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. That was spiritual. It was said to the people who needed that, while in the temple and his cleansing it, it said what they needed to hear. And so when you find Paul writing the great love chapter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, that's spiritual, but at the same time when he confronted Peter to the face because he was a hypocrite, then that was spiritual too. It is simply keeping the commandments of God that makes us what God wants us to be. There's no shortcut. It's bringing every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. That's the goal that we strive for every day we live in the kingdom. Well, with all that said, then I hope we're up to date a little bit on some more things I'd like to bring out concerning what the scriptures uh, teach in emphasizing and further explaining spirituality. The word pneumatikos is the word spiritual. And one fellow has called it an after Pentecost, an after Pentecost word, meaning that's 
used after the church was established in Acts 2. It's, it's, it's not used in uh, the Jewish translation in the Greek of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And it's not used in the four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it always connotes the idea of in the invisibility of the power that works upon us. Now, you think about that for a minute. The power that bears upon us to save our soul is invisible. The mind of God is revealed to us in the Word of God. You can't see it. Even the thoughts that are in the words can't be seen. So what works upon us is on a spiritual level. It's not flesh. It's not anything material. It's not physical. And that word has different usages, several different usages in the New Testament. It refers to things that have their origin with God. Now in that sense, the law of Moses is a spiritual thing because it came from God. Its origin is God. Now it was not designed to do what the law of Christ is to do, the perfect law of liberty. But because it issued forth from God for a given purpose among men, then it's a spiritual thing, Romans 7, 14. Another interesting thing, and um, the Bellevue Lectures this year is going to be dealing along this line, the Old Testament types set forth spiritual things. That's one of the ways that we have help from the Old Testament to understand more of what it is to be a faithful servant of God in the Lord's church today under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. When you consider, and this is a simple example I can think of, when you consider the manna that was the bread God gave to feed the Israelites in their wilderness wanderings, or when water was supplied to them from a rock, then in reality that is typical of something in the New Testament. It is spiritual food. It is spiritual drink. And Paul gives us the divine commentary on what those meant. For in 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, he said, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And by the way, that's one reason that when Moses um, struck the rock rather than speak to it, as he was commanded to do, to speak to it, then he didn't just transgress God's law, but he violated a type. Since he was a type, of Christ himself and the rock itself was typical of the life-giving spiritual water the Lord gives then it was a very serious matter for him to disobey God not just in that it was a transgression of the law serious enough but that it ruined the type so we need to keep that in mind but those types of the Old Testament help us understand a great deal about how to live the Christian life as we put into practice as we're obedient to the truth of God in the New Testament then, too, we learn that God's purposes and His very words are spiritual. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, But we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. And there he again is talking about the words of the New Testament. They did not come from man's own cogitations independent of the God working on them. They came because the Holy Spirit of God revealed the mind of Christ to all of us. And we have it in the perfect law of liberty infallibly set down for us. Now, therefore, if I'm to be a spiritual person, I must be led, guided, and directed by spiritual word. So inspiration was a, com was a complete word-for-word um, -word influence of the Spirit in the original Greek that wrote the New Testament. It was not natural. It was not by human means solely and only. And that's the point that Peter makes when he talks about they were born along by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by the Spirit. It was not dependent upon man's uh, abilities. God overruled that and used them simply to set down infallibly his will. Knowledge 
that is revealed by the Spirit then is spiritual. It is the source of wisdom. It is the source of spiritual strength. Paul penned, We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. I'm going to start at the back of it and go back to the front. What do you think his glorious power is if it has a bearing on your being saved, either becoming a Christian or being faithful as a Christian? Why, you could substitute the word gospel for glorious power, and uh, you'll do no violence to the message in the scriptures. The gospel message is what saves us. It is the New Testament system. Well, where did it come from? It came from the mind of God revealed by the Spirit. So again, it says what I've been saying all along. If we would be spiritual, we must live by the spiritual message. We must put it into practice. That's the reason, too, that emphasis is given throughout the Bible to doing things from the heart. Because the heart as it's used means the inward man of the Spirit. Uh, when we're worshiping God, we're taught that proper worship is in spirit and in truth. The right disposition of mind or spirit and according to the truth, which is itself spiritual. That's um, what's meant with the idea, in, at least in it, in our singing. The songs that we sing must be spiritual. We don't sing secular songs that's why there is such a thing as speaking of secular things there's spiritual things and speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the lord ephesians 5 19 uh, what is the spiritual song well it's a song that is involved with things of the bible when we sing the songs we do in our regular worship period, then of course they must be in harmony with the Bible to be a spiritual song. But when we sing songs fit for the little ones, in the Bible we find Dorcas was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. Well, that's a spiritual song also. It's simply guided and developed by the truth of God. The Holy Spirit's message has been put into a song on a level where they can understand it. Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, again, and spiritual songs. Now, that's the reason that it shouldn't be such a mysterious thing to say, be filled with the Spirit. I think even my own brethren need to understand that, Ephesians 5.18. Because I think they think of the Holy Spirit coming into your body when they see filled with the Spirit. Well, does He come in and go out? I mean, here I am, I'm filled with the Spirit, but the next time I'm going to do these things, I've got to be filled with the Spirit again. Uh, the idea is that you're being filled with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It guides you. It, it keeps you. You're always dwelling on it, meditating on the Word of God day and night. So to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom is the same as being filled with the Spirit. Now that's in Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Spirit. Well, what comes right after verse 18? 19, and that's where you have speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, where do you have the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly? Colossians 3 and verse 16. Well, the context is the same. It's like in our discussion last week of the matter of uh, blessing something. Well, that has to do... Uh, with the Lord's Supper or whether with the prayer in the Lord's Supper when we pray to God thank Him for it that's the blessing at least in that case and this is what's involved here as we compare Ephesians 5.19 Colossians 3.16 so whatever the Spirit does for us spiritually He does it in the Word that leads and guides and directs us for it is the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God Ephesians 6.17 also, to be spiritual or to see the explanation the New Testament gives concerning our being spiritual, it is simply conduct on our part that pleases God. That's spiritual. If I say, biblically, you are a spiritual person, what I'm saying is your conduct 
is according to the Word of God. One becomes spiritual in obedience to the gospel. But we may lose our spirituality. Well, it's not hard to understand how you do that. Just stop obeying God and you'll lose your spirituality. This is the, this the Corinthians uh, were in the process of doing when they were harboring in their inward man envy, strife, and jealousy, which is condemned by Paul in them and all Christians. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. So the test of true spirituality and nothing more or less than the pattern of truth that is in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.15 in chapter 14.37. Also, blessings in Christ are spiritual. Uh, to be blessed is to be made happy. Uh, since Jewish Christians had taught the gospel to the Gentiles, then the latter were debtors to their Jewish brethren. Paul put it this way. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Romans 15, 27 and 1 Corinthians 9, 11. So we can see how it is that being in Christ, we have obeyed the gospel, a spiritual thing, and thus the Lord himself added us to the church and to remain in Christ, we continue to obey the word of God that tells us how to live in Christ. All spiritual blessings then are located in one place. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. But now again, to be in Christ is to be in the church his spiritual body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. In fact, we used that scripture this morning in our discussion and our study of the church. You'll remember that we enter the church by a spiritual birth when we are born of water and the Spirit. Thus, this is taught in John 3 and verse 5. Now, this reference is nothing less or more than our being immersed in water or baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. This is exactly why Paul, in writing a letter to the church at Rome and a part of the New Testament to teach Christians how to be faithful, refers then to the time the Romans became Christians. It was because they were reminded they had to live on that spiritual plane or the plane of living like the New Testament says Christians are to live. So we're... Uh, baptized into the one body of Christ, in Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Yet there's only one baptism, Ephesians 4 and verse 5. At least by the time that Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, there was but one baptism. No matter how many there were before, Paul said in around AD 62 when the letter was written, there was but one. Now how do you know which one it is? Well, it's the one to be preached to the end of the world. Now, which one is that? It has to be the baptism of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18. So that's the one that, uh, no matter how many there had been before, that's the one that's abiding. Now, why? Because it's the one when obeyed from the heart, you're in Christ. You're put into Christ, where all spiritual blessings and heavenly places are located. So you're qualified to do those things members of the church are to do. Take a person, let's say today, who is not a Christian. He's not authorized to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now God wants him to be able to scripturally partake of the Lord's Supper. But he must qualify himself. He must be a spiritual qualification. But how does he do that? He receives with meekness the proper attitude of submission the engrafted word, that is, the gospel of Christ, the power of God to save him. Now when from the heart he obeys that, his sins are remitted, and he's now in the church where all spiritual blessings are located. One of them is the right to be able to this do in remembrance of me and showing forth the Lord's death till he come. He's qualified to do that, but he must be qualified first. You can't say in prayer, our Father which art in heaven, if he's not your Father. So you have to become a Christian to do that. 
if it's to be acceptable. Not to say you can't do it in the sense of going through the motions, but it won't be recognized by God. You know, there are people all around us today that give millions of dollars to help poor folks, and that's all well and good. I promise you the poor folks appreciate it. But these people aren't Christians. And God's not going to take note of any of it. Because He's going to take note of those people who are spiritual. But those people who are spiritual are Christians in the way the Bible defines Christians and how they became Christians. So it all comes back down to abiding by the truth of God. All God-approved activities in the church then are spiritual we must offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 5, Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. There are a lot of things that people do outside the church that are greater than I will ever do from the standpoint of helping people uh, as far as their physical needs are concerned. But they're not going to be taken note of by God because you must be in Christ. The place of new creatures spiritually. You must be forgiven of sins by your obedience to the gospel. And unless you're willing to receive the truth that is taught in the Lord, you may have a very pious attitude and desirous of doing a lot of things. But if you won't submit to the teachings of the Spirit and the gospel, you can't become a Christian. And thus you can't live on a spiritual plane. Our highest spiritual service, I think, is set out in Romans 12.1 where Paul is pictured his own bended knee begging those brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The American Standard says, which is your spiritual service. In a fact, it's saying like your reasonable service is a spiritual service. And that's obedience to God. In the church. In the infant church, spiritual activities were accompanied by these miraculous helps in view of the fact they had no completed New Testament. That's why they're called spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, 14, verse 1. They help them do, without growing into it, what every Christian is to be doing. But today, we have the completed New Testament. We don't need those things. We just need the dedication to spend time in studying and learning the mind of God and living on that plane. The Christian warfare, as it's called in the Bible, is a spiritual thing. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, Paul said it this way. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, then, if they're not carnal, they must be spiritual. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6.12. We, in let's just take debates, when we affirm the truth of the gospel at any point, and somebody else is denying it, then we go to the Bible rightly divided, and we teach the truth and expose the error. That is a spiritual war. When we're talking to a neighbor or somewhere in a Bible study and we're trying to refute error, that which is contrary to the New Testament, we're engaged in spiritual warfare. And you know, someone has said a long, long time ago, the pen is mightier than the sword. Now, why would they say that? Because ideas move people and it moves them to have great changes on this earth. And right now in this very country, this very moment, we have a great fight going on concerning our founding fathers and what they had concerning a nation and their concept of it and having set it down in the Constitution of the United States. And it makes a difference, doesn't it, whether we abide by the authority of the Constitution and the laws derived therefrom or whether we make it a living document, as they call it, and uh, people just pretty well do what they want to because that thing is over 200 years old and everybody knows somebody living back then didn't know how we are going to live, so it's all outdated and done. Well, all those things are battles from the standpoint of ideas. It's the battle of the mind when we engage in these things. So we must make incessant war. Listen, 
against every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. You know, when you consider what Campbell did over 200 years ago, when Campbell looked at that which was contrary to the Bible, it made no difference what it was. He handled all error in the same way. It was erroneous. Sometimes we forget that, well, you know, I just, this thing here seems to be far worse than this thing. Well, if it's error, it's error. And it ought to be dealt with as error. Whether my mother or daddy believes it, or whether my brother or sister believes it, or whether my wife or husband or children believe it, if it is contrary to the spiritual word of God, it ought to be dealt with accordingly. So we've got to be against every form of evil and error. And what is evil and error but that which is against the authority of Christ in the New Testament? So if you look, and we won't do it right now, but if you look at every part of the armor that Paul says we're to put on, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, you'll see it's a spiritual application. It's arming the mind. It's arming the inward man so that we'll be able to stand. And in effect... It's a synonym for the gospel or at least the result of the gospel in our lives. And you'll notice that both in defense and offense, our armor and weapons are all involved in knowing correctly the word of God. Verse 17. Then the last point we'll make this afternoon is in the resurrection, the faithful will have a spiritual body. Now this refers not necessarily to the soul, but it's talking about, and we use soul here to mean the spiritual part of us, the non-material part of us, but it has to do with that non-material part of us that is the real you and the centering core of your being, your person, being reunited with a resurrected body which is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body, not flesh and blood, but incorruptible and immortal, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, and verses 15 through 52. So whatever this body is, flesh and blood, it won't be that. The real you and the real me will be housed in a body, but it won't be a natural body. It will be a body that is as fitted to the new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, as is this body being fitted for the here and now. It will be, according to Philippians 3, 20 and 21, and also John writing in 1 John 3, 3, a glorious body. Now that's interesting. Because this morning we ended the lesson about the spiritual body of Christ being a glorious church. Well, the body we shall receive in the resurrection will be a glorious body. Because it will be fitted to live and exist and function in a place where there's no possibility of sin and none of the consequences of sin. None of the cares that we all face, no matter how good a life we have in the flesh, all that kind of thing. Have you ever just, and try this sometime, try to sit down sometime and, and just enumerate the things that we must deal with that are normal to our life in the flesh. Not necessarily just pain and anguish, but the things that are the cares that come our way because we're flesh and blood. And then say, I'll have none of that when I'm resurrected into a spiritual body fitted for heaven. And I think you'll find how much there really is weighing on our minds besides the matter of making sure we're obedient to Christ and steadfast in the faith through every day of our lives. Just to be outside and beyond the demands of being physical in a world polluted by sin in a material world is an amazing thing that I doubt our minds can begin to comprehend. But we ought to be thinking about it because this is a temporary dwelling place. We're just dealing with these things for a little while. The cares of this world, the dealing with sin, the forgiveness of sins, the living a righteous life, the hope of eternal life, all that's passing rather rapidly. 
I told Brother James this morning, I said, well, you know, I'm considerably younger than you are, but there's not a thing in the world to say that I can't leave this world before you do. And if I do, I'm going to tell them you're coming. Now, that's the way it ought to be because, you see, you're that glorious church, whether you're in the body physically here or whether you're out of the physical body in realms of glory. You're still members of the Lord's glorious blood-bought church. So the church is an amazing thing as it's pictured in the New Testament. It's meant to exist eternally and to live spiritually, to live as the New Testament says people are to live. And that's what we all ought to crave because it makes us in the likeness of Christ creates a character that's fitted for glory and that's what we all want to be. So the attitude toward the truth, toward the Word of God, toward obedience to that truth is so important. Are we willing to change our minds according to the mind of Christ as presented in the words of Christ in the New Testament? Now do you understand better a passage we quote most often? He that rejecteth me, Jesus said, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him the words that I have spoken. The same shall judge him the last day. If you're subject to the call of Christ, will you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God? Upon that belief, will you keep the commandment to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30, to confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, complete your obedience to the Lord by being baptized in the Christ for the remission of sins. Now check yourself if you're a Christian. Are you living spiritually? That is, are you keeping the commandments God says children of God are to keep? Are you striving to keep your life in harmony with it? That's what we're to do. That's being faithful. And in being faithful, that's being spiritual. If you need to repent of any sins, then we urge you to do so and pray God for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and sing.